This photo has no historical value, but it's a recreation of a truly bewildering event. This man was trying to tame the devil with a screwdriver and subsequently brought upon himself a truly horrible death. To truly appreciate just how incredible this photo is, we need to understand nuclear chemistry. What's being depicted is a nuclear warhead being checked to make sure it's still ready to explode. Now, I shouldn't have to tell you that poking at a critical nuclear warhead with a screwdriver is a bad idea, but let's figure out just why this is such an incredible photo. Something happens when atomic nuclei become too big. They become unstable. Sure, it makes sense. Even in our world, things can only get so big. But why do nuclei have a size limit? In a nucleus, you have protons and ideally an equal number of neutrons all smushed really close together. Now this should seem impossible, as the electrostatic repulsion from the like charges of protons should cause them to eject away from each other. But for some reason, they don't. Inside every single proton and neutron are three quarks binding with each other through the strong force. Now this interaction is almost perfect, but some of the energy being shared breaks containment and stimulates the creation of mesons, which is just a quark-antiquark -quark pair. Mesons are then attracted themselves to specific quarks on the inside of hadrons nearby, essentially pulling them together. Then it quickly annihilates itself and the process is repeated. This attraction only occurs between proton and neutron, otherwise the meson is repulsed by the quarks in the other hadron. This attraction is called the nucleonic force, or nuclear force. But there's another, even stronger force called spin pairing that holds nuclei together. Spin is essentially the alignment or direction of the electrical fields created by particles. If the fields of opposite charges line up, then they can bind together. And if the fields of like charges are opposite, they can also bind. Spin pairing is just about 10 times stronger than the nucleonic force and creates a chain of pairs with this pattern all throughout the nucleus. Now we know why protons don't just fly away. Nucleonic forces and spin pairing keep them tied together. But these forces only extend a very short distance. So when our nucleus starts to get really big, the protons out here only feel the attraction of these nearby nucleons while feeling the repulsion of all the protons. At some point, the repulsion is stronger than the attraction, and this happens to be at lead. Elements larger than lead are no longer stable, and, given enough time, will eventually decay down to lead to lower their internal energy. So what's going on in this photo? Nuclear weapons rely on the principle that unstable atoms are, well, unstable. If left alone, plutonium-239, the material we used in older warheads, will decay into lead after a couple billion years. However, if supplied just a tiny bit more energy in the form of a collision with a neutron, plutonium will completely split into two smaller atoms. Now this cleaving is never perfect and on average will release 2.9 or 3 free neutrons into the environment. These neutrons then have the opportunity to split additional plutonium atoms. This chain reaction can cause nuclear explosions. Nuclear explosions, though, are actually rather difficult to create from these chain reactions. You need just the right parameters and conditions. If you don't trigger a fast enough chain reaction at the exact right time, you can cause a pre-detonation, which means it gets really hot really fast and this heat destroys the material before a substantial amount can fizzle. This will still cause a substantial thermal explosion, but you won't get the value back invested in the processes to make the fuel. Fizzle material exists in three states, subcritical, critical, and supercritical. These each describe the rate at which neutrons trigger additional fission. Subcritical means that for every atom that splits, it produces on average less than one additional fission reaction from the neutrons it releases. Supercritical means it produces more than one, and critical means it's balanced and each fission event produces one more fission event. Critical mass is a parameter that describes which state a fizzle material is in based on multiple variables. Basically, if you choose a value for all of these parameters, critical mass states how much of that material you would need for the neutrons released from one fission event to trigger another. So if we imagined our demon core was 5 kilograms and at critical mass, then if we change a variable to lower the critical mass, then we would have an excess of mass and thus our core would become supercritical. 
If we increase the critical mass, then the core would become subcritical. Both subcritical and supercritical masses affect reactivity exponentially. So if a material becomes subcritical, it will exponentially decay until it turns itself off. Alternatively, supercritical masses will increase exponentially until either causing a pre-detonation or having their critical mass changed by altering one of these variables. Enter Louis Slotin. Today, he's going to make sure the nuclear core, now known as the demon core, is still close to criticality. To do this, we place a scintillation counter nearby to measure the ionizing radiation and make sure it's a rate consistent with criticality. In order to coax the warhead out of sleep, two beryllium hemispheres are placed almost around it. Beryllium acts as a neutron reflector and moderator, so that means if a neutron released from fission doesn't encounter another atom on its journey, it can reflect off the beryllium sphere back into the core and try again. As a result, these neutron reflectors lowers the critical mass of the core and can actually cause it to become supercritical. Normally, these two hemispheres are separated by two wedges, and this little gap right here is the only thing stopping our nuclear core from becoming supercritical, or starting an exponential nuclear chain reaction. Louis Slotin, for some machismo reason, used screwdrivers instead. And as one would expect, eventually, on one occasion, while lowering the top half of the beryllium sphere, the screwdriver slipped out, causing the hemispheres to close together. This caused the sphere to become supercritical and immediately flashed Slotin's body with a lethal dose of ionizing radiation. The heat from supercriticality caused the reaction to slow down briefly enough to give Slotin the opportunity to flip the top half of the core onto the ground, preventing further reaction. For him, though, he was already dead. Slotin died nine days later in agony due to acute radiation poisoning. For me, the most fascinating thing about all of this is just how much a difference this tiny little bit of space made, and how extreme the consequences are from such a small change. On top of this, it's quite mind-blowing the fact that this core was so precariously balanced at criticality, just a tiny push away from something quite extreme. So remember, give yourself some breathing room when you need it. It's never fun when it feels like all your responsibilities are clamped down around you at once.